before I get to my study, I just wanted to share something personal with you. As you're my family. I grew up in a really wonderful home with loving folks, but my father was a legalist. Not not overbearing, but he, he didn't understand grace. And my mother was a very loving woman, but she was a lascivious, addictive type person. And that's pretty confusing. Really interesting <laughs> dynamic between those two. But between the ages of 17 and 21, I made a lifetime full of my own mistakes. Desperate, desperate. By the time I was 21 years old, I was in desperate straits within myself and finally turned to the Lord and uh, had a wonder. God just saved me out of it. He just, when the Holy Spirit came into my life and my soul and my body, it was dramatic. I mean, I, I, I busted out of there. And I began to learn doctrine. Between 21 and 31, I packed enough doctrine in for a lifetime. I just was a taper. I was in Bible class. I'd been here five years, coming to every Bible class that could be. But let me tell you, I had doctrine coming out my ears. But I was a miserable person because I had so much baggage. Just the things he talked about this morning, the filthiness and the excess of wrong thinking producing these bad results in my life. Had all the doctrine, but I couldn't use a bit of it, hardly. I mean, I could use it some, but as far as the joy, the peace, the, 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 the witness of my soul and my life to other people, the ability to love was just not formed yet because all the doctrine kept butting into all of this old, and here's what happened to me at about 31, 32. I ran into somebody that taught me to start listening to what I said to myself and the images that I formed in my mind. And when I did that, I discovered why I felt so bad because I was saying a lot of really hateful, mean stuff to myself. And, he, and this person taught me to get rid of that. Stop listening to the lie and put it off. And boy, when I did that, whew, it was like, wow, my soul was free. And then there would be another one. And the Lord would say, look at it and understand what it is and call it the lie that it is and remove it. That was such a dramatic help to my life. I've never been able to shut up about it. I can't even shut up about it now. I'm supposed to teach on the Holy Spirit, and I'm still teaching. But anyway. I want to share with you the reason why what Paul and, and James are saying about this put off is that you can't live your life out spiritually holding on to all of that wrong stuff. Can't do it. Can't be done. It's to be removed. And I, and I pray that you learn that and approach it. Turn to John 14, and we're going to discuss two basic things about the Holy Spirit. We're going to discuss his relationship with us, ours to him, and what is, it, what is his ministry to us? What is it we're to be, when it says be filled, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean? And so let's look at that. John 14, we'll look at verse 16, uh, 17, 16 through 17, and then 26, and Verse 16 and 17, he says, I will, this is now Jesus, you got to understand, Jesus, this is the upper room discourse, Jesus is leaving, and he's trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. Here, you know, he's going to go to the cross, he's going to resurrect, and he's going to spend 50 days teaching and preparing, and then he's going to ascend and, and sit down at the right hand in session, and when he does, the Spirit the helper, the comforter is going to be sent to take his place. So that's, that's what they we're in a discussion of that in John 14. He says, I will ask, this is when he goes and sits in session. As soon as, listen, as soon as he sits down, the spirit took off. Then this is, all, listen, we know the Holy Spirit's omnipresent. So he wasn't in heaven and had to take off. That's just images that God has given us so we can relate to it. 
But he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's a real important phrase. That he may be with you how long? How are you going to lose your salvation if he's with you forever? I mean, you're a lost person indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That makes sense, doesn't it? That is, the, that is and he's going to identify him, the spirit of truth, one of his great titles, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see or acknowledge him or know him. But you, born again believer, you know him because he abides with you and listen. Here's something that blew their mind because they were temple people. Everything was the temple this, the temple that. And he says the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. You're going to, it's going to become the naos, the, the dwelling place. Your body is going to be the dwelling place of God. To Jews who had been worshiping at a temple that was supposed to be the, the place of God, to learn that he was going to be in you, listen, shut the front door. Shut the front door. Now, in verse 26, and we'll get down to some talking, he says, the helper, this parakletos, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Understand this, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. He's not an exciter. He's not a rah-rah. He doesn't activate your emotion directly only through what he teaches you. So all of this emotionalism is not evidence of the Spirit. He will teach you and bring to your mind, bring to your remembrance, the recall ministry, all that I have taught you already. So let's look at some principles of, we'll break down. He says, the Spirit, he says, the Father will send you another helper. This word, another, is real important. It's alas in comparison to heteros. The word parakletos has a lot of meanings. It means someone who encourages. It literally means to come up beside. See, the word para means side by side. It's parallel. All right, you're called to the side of someone. And the kletos part, it means to help to aid, to encourage, to guide, to give counsel, to comfort. That's the whole idea. You come beside someone, literally in someone for him, and you you guide, you teach, you encourage, you correct. This is what he does. He's in us. He's our mentor. Now, the word alas, if you'll turn just right quick to Galatians 1, this is really, really important. Galatians 1, uh, 6 and 7. You need to understand the significance of that word alas. I'm not going to dig into Greek here, but I need these two words. This word alas is important. Now, alas means another. You know the word another? You know, we're going to find another place for our, for where there's another place where our ministry is supposed to be. We've, we've come to understand that the Lord has, we're winding down and he wants us to have a ministry in another place. That's my belief. But another place like this one. Okay? Now the word heteros means another place different from this one. You know, if I said uh, Ernie is another person, it would be uh, the idea, alas, would be another man like me. And if I said, you know, Michelle is another person, heteros, that would mean someone different than me, a woman. You follow that? Now, if you read Galatians 1, verse 6, Paul says, uh, well, I'm sorry, in the verse chapter 2, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly abandoning him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Now, what word are we using here? Alas or heteros? Different. It's heteros. It means a, a gospel not like, the one you've, not like the one I gave you. It's different. You follow? Okay. Thank you. And he said, 
which is not another alas. I mean, he said, it's not another like the one I gave you. In other words, what these people are teaching you is not built on the grace gospel I've given you, and it's a further building of it and clarification. It's not connected to me at all. It's not like what I gave you. It's different. It's wrong. It's false. It's evil. Follow? So, he said, it's not really another like the one I gave you. Uh, only some are troubling you and wishing to pervert the gospel I gave you because, by giving you a different gospel. Now, if you go back to John 14, verse 16, he says, we have another helper, an alas helper. Now, that alas is another of the same kind, okay? Here's the point. The Holy Spirit in our life is to have the same relationship that Christ had to the disciples, okay? He's, he's taking the place of what the disciples enjoyed and benefited from in our life. He's, he's the connection with the divine. He's our connection. As they were intimate with Jesus and they walked with him, they listened to him, he corrected them. Listen, he knew their mind. He read their minds. He knew their motives. He knew what they were thinking. Of course, you know, for a smart guy, it's not hard to see goofballs like that, you know. But the Spirit is to have the same. We're to see his ministry in our life as that same ministry that they saw in Jesus. You see that? Listen, Holy Spirit's important. There is no spiritual life without the Holy Spirit. Everything we call Christianity, apart from the Holy Spirit, is simply, if it's good, it's, it's divine institutions. It's morality. It's being a good person. You go to any church, pick any church, and you're going to go and hear the message, and it's going to say, be a good person that your witness for the Lord is for you to be a moral, upstanding, tax-paying citizen, uh, American through and through, and that's your ministry. And you know what? That's a gospel of a different kind. That's heteros. That's not, that's not the biblical perspective. Those are wonderful things to instill in your children and to live out the divine establishment. But look, when a believer lives in the spirit, the morality of divine institutions is automatically produced. You don't have to live by that. See, you say, well, you got to follow the rules. Nah, that's a, that's a totally wrong emphasis. Don't even look at the rules. Look at the spirit. Learn and grow. Be renewed. This is the learning process when it says, take off this crap that you put in your soul. Be renewed. The learning, what we're doing right now is the renewal. And as you assimilate and begin to understand, once you've taken off, you take this new idea, this God idea, the Christ idea, and you put it in your heart and you embrace it and you make it yourself. That's the Spirit's ministry. He's another helper of the same kind. Now, the Spirit is a teacher, a mentor, just like Jesus. I mean, if you read the Gospels and you watch Jesus, and boy, he, you know, you really have to look at Jesus to, 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 to get an insight into him. He's very kind. He's very intuitive. I mean, he looks at somebody and he knows. And I don't know if this is deity or it's just that he was so perceptive and so tuned in to the helping of other people that he could just read people and say, that person's desperately suffering. Let me help them. Let me show you how to alleviate all that. Let, let me show you how to connect through me. I'm the, I'm the door. What a loving, giving. I mean, and listen, this was to everybody. This was, his family didn't believe in him. They thought... Boy, he's a great guy. 
I hated growing up with him because he was perfect. You know, he never got spanked. Can you imagine Jesus getting spanked? But, I mean, for what? Uh, I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure he might have got beat up a few times. But anyway, just like Jesus, they walked with them and he with them. This is a reciprocal relationship. See, I don't know what you think about the Holy Spirit. Some invisible force that works in your life every now and then. Look, he's, he's, your, he's your mentor. He's your teacher. He's your leader. He's your, you should be focused on what he's saying to you, what he's showing you in the eyes of your... You should be, you should be focused on that. And looking at the Lord, listen. See, he never talks about himself. We have to talk about him. Jesus talked about him. That's what he's doing in this passage. He's going to reveal Christ. He's going to reveal the divine plan that when you get saved, you're a baby believer, and you go through these stages of growth, if you grow, if you decide to be hungry, if you decide to be hungry, you're going to grow spiritually. He's, all, he, he's the force behind all that. So, he knew their thoughts, he instructed, corrected, and he chided them, you little faiths, you have little, he, he just made fun of them, he mocked them, all in love. Our relation to the Spirit is intended to be as intimate and real as the disciples was with Christ. Now, we're not to see him as we see Christ, Christ is our all in all. He's our head. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. But the Holy Spirit's Lord too. Listen, they're the same. They're co-equal. They're co-eternal. They play different roles in our life. But, so, he says he's the helper, the parakletos. And this word means to come alongside, to give aid. To give aid. Uh, it's one who instructs or gives counsel. This is, this is my niche. You know, many years ago, God just, listen, he allowed me to grow up with the problems that I did. Okay? None of this was by accident. He knew what I was going to choose. He knew that I was going to be desperately messed up, desperately miserable, and I don't know if you were. Listen, when I first started to understand the takeoff thing, I was thought it was a psychological issue with people that were messed up. But then I discovered <laughs> we're all messed up. And it just looks different in different people. Some people are so messed up, they look great. <laughs> you know, Bob Thames said there's two different kinds of degeneracy. It's one is moral degeneracy, and that's religion, the self-righteous who looks at other people, <laughs> they look at us, the civious people, and they look down on us and think, hmm, you disgust me. Judging. I'm so righteous. You're so sinful. No. <laughs> You're just as sinful in a different way. That's all it is. That's the filthiness that this James is talking about that's in us that we bring in with us that needs to be removed. But this is the Spirit's job. He comes alongside and he gives us insight about what the word means. And when I say what it means, I mean how it lives out. If you have trapped yourself in a mindset that says hearing the word is the key to my spiritual life, and you've not understood that it's actually living the word that brings blessing. There's not a lot of blessing for just knowing the word. A lot, in fact, Paul said it puffs up. It makes you arrogant because you know so much. It's the living it out. He says love edifies. If your heart of hearts is not to edify, when you're, listen, when you're in the spirit, walking in the spirit, if your heart of hearts is not to edify every one you touch, then you're not connected. You don't know the truth. You don't know the truth. So, he's a helper. He's an advocate, a supporter, one who protects and mediates. He has, he has a million roles in our life. He's our mediator. He's our teacher, our mentor, our comforter, all kinds of things. 
Now, the spirit who indwells us, and Dr. Bertel thinks that the Holy Spirit indwells the human spirit. And I go, okay, if you say so, uh, that's fine with me. I don't see how it makes any actual practical difference in my life, but fine with me. Uh, and he indwells us, and he is like Christ. as He's our teacher, our trainer, our spiritual helper, our encourager, our comforter, our disciplinarian. Listen, when you get saved and you are a baby, God, the word brephos, 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, desire, and that word is a command. Listen to me. The word is a command. Y'all pardon me, I got to sit. <laughs> the word is a command. The word desire, listen. Do you understand the word desire? is a command. You have to choose it. You have to choose. You say, listen, I come and I listen, but I really am not that hungry. I'm really not that hungry. I'm just kind of going through the motions. I wish I was hungry. If that's you, I'm going to tell you, it's a choice to, to turn yourself to be hungry to tell yourself to be hungry, to imagine yourself hungry, to embrace that and say, I'm going to be hungry for the word. You will never, ever regret that choice. It may be the most important choice in your life. It's definitely the most important choice of who you marry. And I had a conversation with somebody at the half about that. And boy, did I hit the jackpot. Two believers growing together, spiritually growing in the Lord, Holy Spirit's in both of us, connecting us together, mentoring us and teaching us and showing us, laughing at us as we flail around, stumbling in the Spirit. So, he plays the same role for us forever that Jesus played for three years for the disciples. So, before we leave that, do you get that? The same familiarity, the same intimacy. Do you think they you think that the disciples loved Jesus? Oh my gosh, they were they didn't know how they could live without him. When he said, I've got to leave and I'm not coming back. How do you how do you live? He said, Are you guys gonna leave me? And Peter says, Where would we go? Can you imagine losing God in your life? Ah. Uh, uh, I can't. I don't know what would happen. And listen, he, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is that one person who plays that role. Listen, he's inside of you. He's, uh, he's the only person who's inside of your soul with you. You're not ever alone. He's in your soul with you. Now, here's the point. Embrace him. Trust him. Look to him. There are many believers that I think have never actually connected with the Holy Spirit. They don't hear his voice. They don't sense his presence. They don't, he's not real to them. They believe it as a principle, but they don't know the practice of, I don't, I don't, you can't be spiritual like that. If you're just, if you've got a set of rules you're going by and your way of being a Christian is just checking these boxes off, you're not spiritual. I, I mean, I'm not trying to criticize you. I'm just saying you've not, you've not found the gold mine. You've not broken into the treasure room. The treasure room is the joy and love and peace of the spirit. That's the treasure. That's real treasure. You think money's treasure? That's ridiculous. The real treasure, look, I talked to a very young lady I love dearly, and, excuse me, she has peace. First time, felt the peace of God. That's incredible. She connected with the Spirit. She heard the Spirit. She felt the Spirit. She, she knew he was there. Do you know that? Do you know 
for certain because of, an, a, of a personal experience that the Spirit is in you and speaking to you? Do you live in that light? Do you live in that reality? I mean, when you wake up in the morning, do you look and listen to what he's saying? You know, he's talking to you all the time. He's a chatterbox. He's, he's, a, he's a chatterbox. I mean, he's constantly trying to move you in the right direction. Constantly. Now, the question is, are you listening? Are you focused on what he's saying? You follow? We're to have that same relationship that, I mean, look, they everywhere, Jesus said, hey, we're going to Bethany. <laughs> they didn't question. They said, all right, you know, you think we can get some donkeys this time? He's like, no, nah, I'd rather walk. And he says, you, you, you're the boss. You're the boss. You know, listen, <laughs> you didn't really live to you get to that place where you let God be the boss. If you're still the boss, anyway, he's called the spirit of truth. In verse 17, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. That's because 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the unbeliever who's not indwelt and under the ministry of the spirit can understand spiritual things. The human mind in itself is incapable of perceiving divine phenomena, spiritual phenomena. You with me? As an unbeliever, or listen, or a believer immersed in old man nonsense, dominated and controlled by the old way, and that may even be a moral, religious way, and you may look like a million bucks in the church, but you're deader than a doornail as far as the Spirit's concerned. You're, uh, you're not being spiritual. Anyway, he's the spirit of truth, and he's in you forever. He's in me forever. I'm just, wow. He's, he's going to teach me, and listen, that's the main thing that he does. If you ever get to where you look to the spirit and listen to the spirit, and listen, this thing, Bertel, Bertel believes that over, as you mature spiritually, that you and the spirit kind of merge together. You merge together. You know, he does that thing where he puts the dye in the water and it, it, it mixes together. So he thinks the spirit ultimately merges so you you and he are in a oneness. And I, I believe that might be right. But he is, he's a spirit of truth that teaches you truth and reminds you in your day-to-day, moment-to-moment walk of what the truth is, how it works, how it applies, what applies in any given situation. Listen, it's like having your instructor right there with you every moment to guide you through life. So it, it's, it's beyond incredible. It's just, you can't imagine. And listen, in all of the old covenant, very few people enjoyed, benefited in this way. In our day, the moment you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection for you personally, the Spirit comes to indwell your body, and he connects you with Jesus Christ, making you part of his body, connecting all of us together. There's like a spiritual string that runs through your chest, out your back, to the next person's chest. I mean, we're just connected up. Even with the believers in heaven, church age, but we're all connected What a ministry. Uh, And that's forever. Never stop. Nobody can cut that string, not even you. Can't cut the string. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says he connects us to Christ. We become his body. In this life, we become his body. In in the eternal state, we become his bride. Uh, The spirit then, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, indwells makes us the temple of God. We are the temple. Listen, collectively, the church-age believer, all of them, are living stones that make up the temple of God. If he were to, and he ultimately will, pull us all together at the same time, we would be living stones that that make up a literal temple for God. 
That's we will be the temple. We are the temple. So now it says he's a teacher, counselor. Um, if you now turn with me to Ephesians 5.18, just real quick. Ephesians 5.18, and this is our landmark passage we use to try to understand the beginning of this ministry that he has for us. And I want to try to bring a little clarification to how this works, uh, at least in my life. And I think biblically I, I'm on target. He's a teacher or a counselor. He ministers to the soul and, and to the body. Listen, he ministers to the body, but primarily to the soul, to the mind, to help you understand and know. Understand and know. That's his job. He doesn't directly impact emotion that I can see anywhere. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says the spirit directly impacts and makes you emotional. It's a charismatic thing that I think it's Kenneth Hagin. It's a lot big, a huge auditorium filled with people, and he walks around laughing, and he touches people, and they start laughing too. They can't stop laughing. They flop on the ground and stuff, and I, now, I, forgive me for criticizing if you're into that. Uh, please don't bring it here, but it's just they say that's the spirit. And you've got a present imperative with the negative may, and that can easily mean stop doing something you're already doing. So listen, if you're, if you're controlled by alcohol, I'm not talking about an occasional beer. If, I'm talking about you have to drink. You have to drink. I, I, I met with a man the other day when he walked up. It just smelled like alcohol. Just drink so much it comes out his pores. That's a problem. This is what he's saying. Stop living this lifestyle because it leads, it says, to dissipation. What is your what is your say? I mean, mine says it leads to dissipation or wantonness. And the what the word means, it means a lifestyle of unrestrained seeking of pleasure. Unrestrained. So listen, this, this is important. The word means to be surrendered to this self-destructive way of life. You're surrendered to it. It's got you. You follow? Because when he says be filled with the Spirit, same idea. Surrendered. All right. This be, he says it's a present passive imperative. The passive mood indicates... Listen, when you have a pass, when you have an impair, a command, look, the active voice says the believer produces the action. The passive voice says the action is done to the believer. So how do you give somebody a command to let something be done to you? Okay? Lay there and let me stab you. That's passive. Don't do anything while something else is done to you. That's the command. So... Pretty important stuff if you understand. Now, he says, stop pleasure seeking. And listen, this can be, you can get addicted to television. Uh, you can get addicted to Fixer Upper. You know what that is? What's the name of that show? Yeah, you're Fixer Upper. You can get addicted to that. I mean, I like, it's a good show. You can ad get addicted to anything. Movies, you know, alcohol, ball games, fishing. Of course, I don't think you can get addicted to fishing or golf. Any one of those, you can do all that you want, and it never, it's all, I think, the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus was a fisherman. So, you know, it's just following, and it's just being like Christ. But anyway, uh, so he says, stop. James says, take it off. Paul, in this passage, before he, listen, He's already told us to take it off. Now he says, stop doing it. Instead, Allah means in contrast to be filled, present passive imperative, by, with or by the Spirit. There's discussion about does this mean be in the sphere of the Spirit? Does it mean or the Spirit is going to act upon you, be filled by the Spirit? 
interesting discussion. This word pleuroo is a really interesting word. I read a lot about it. It means to, the, the ultimate, it means to pay. It means to provide supply. You follow? You provide, listen, when you get your paycheck, it's, it's supply. It's supply. Uh, by the way, I heard an interesting statistic, just, just, a, just a footnote, that in, since 1971, when we went off the gold standard, that the productivity of the American worker has risen about 78%. So the American worker is producing almost 80% more than they were than we were in, in 1970. And some of that's technology, a lot of things. But middle class wage worker wages have hardly risen at all. That's an issue. And that's why the middle class is starting to disappear. But that's the some people are surrendered to an idea that's creating greater and greater inequity, and that's not good. But you be filled, the word means to pay, to provide supply. To, it literally means to fill up, to supply fully, and it also means to influence. That's the way I like to see it, is to be totally influenced See, I don't like the word control. We used to say you're controlled by the Spirit, but I think that whole, I understand that, but, uh, but you look, you still have, it's your volition in all of this. It's the great issue, volition, in all of this to remain in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to live your life in that sphere of the Spirit, to continue to be influenced by the Spirit. That's a choice. And when, you, when you're in the Spirit, which is an absolute you're not controlled, but you are, if you're open and surrender to him, you are influenced, enabled, empowered. So this filling means to be surrendered and receptive and open to this ministry, to the supply. Now, it's a present imperative, means that present imperative is a standing command it's a moment-by-moment moment focus on the Spirit's ministry. When you walk into Walmart, you get what you need, and you come to the counter. Are you listening to the Spirit? Does the Spirit say, give this person the gospel? Give that lady the gospel. Ask her if she knows about Jesus. I say, hey, have you heard about Jesus? And they go, yeah, I've heard about Jesus. I said, what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? And they'll always go, well, probably be a good person, you know, do more good deeds than bad deeds. That's the, the, the TV version, Hollywood version. And I go, well, you know, here's what I believe. Because if you let them tell you what they believe, then they'll let you tell, you tell them what you believe. It's real smooth. So I say, you know, when Christ was on the cross, every wrong thing that would keep a person from going to heaven, every one of them, past, present, future, was put together and put on him, and the Father in heaven judged him in our place, and he paid for every bit of it. There's a zero balance. Then he died and defeated death itself by coming back to life. And if you believe that he did it for you, he give you eternal life. It takes about a minute, smooth as he can be. And listen, they are not offended by it. You just have to have the courage to do it. Listen, who are you? Who are you? I mean, what's your job here? What's your purpose for being here? To make money? To build retirement? That's ridiculous. You're, a, you're an ambassador. That's your only reason for being here. And the ministry you have to those around you, the only reason the believer is left here on the earth is to do ministry for God. And I, it's my hope for you, not for me, but for you, that you come to a place in your life where you surrender all of your life to God, you have that capacity through your growth, you give all of your yourself, your soul, your body, your heart, your resources, everything is his for his use. Everything. Do you not think that's how it should be? Really, truly? <laughs> I do. I know it is. And anything short of that 
See, I used to live in the world, working, producing for the world to make money to build up my earthly agenda and everything. And I had a, like a 10% relationship with God. The tithe, you know, I had a 10% idea. And one day God said, well, what's this 10% deal you got going with me? He said, you know, all the, I, 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 I like the fact that you give me 10% of whatever. And then he said, but you know, all of that's really mine. You're just giving me my stuff back. And I'm like, he said, what if I want, to give, want you to give it all away? That's what he said to the rich young ruler, wasn't it?